Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Framerate is brought to you by Squarespace, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE2. And they recently launched a developer platform for complete code control. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash frame rate. Frame Rate episode 111. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and I'm pretty sure that was uh, that was yet unconfirmed footage of Leo Laporte celebrating after last night's Super Bowl. A quiet, he... secret Baltimore fan, it turns out. Oh, is that right? He just kind of switched allegiances at the last minute and decided to tear down a street sign? That's right. Also changed races. A lot of people don't know that he could do that. Leo's a very talented guy. Look, there's nothing the man can't do if he puts his mind to it, okay? I, apparently, Leo's a believer in that. You know what else he believes in? The big story. This just in, the big story. Casa de Cartas is out, ladies and gentlemen. The big gamble, the big bet. What is the future of television? It rides on this very series. Am I overhyping it? Uh, you know what? I think it sounds uh, it's it's that's that certainly has reached parity with the level of hype leading into this. Whether or not it turns out to be true or not, I'll tell you what, man. First of all, disclosures: I'm up to what episode six now. I cheated I'm up to on my episode life. three. I'm up to episode I, three now. I we were watching it side by side. She went to bed right uh, during the Super Bowl last night, and I couldn't help myself. I just 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 one just one without her. I, I'll rewatch it with you later, sweetheart. So I'm up to like episode six. What are you thinking so far? I like it. Uh, you know, I, I want to get to the to the media hype in a second. But yeah, overall, uh, again, three episodes in, not six. I think that the story is compelling. It took me a while in that first episode for really to catch hold. But by the end of the episode, I was like, okay, how is he going to pull this off? What's going to happen? What are these relationships leading to? Uh, I think the writing is is good. There, it, it, there are parts when I feel like it, it's just, just incredibly stellar, uh, and it, and it's not as even as you know. I would like it to be evenly stellar all the time, obviously. So yeah, is that uh, too much to ask Hollywood yeah, or right? New Hollywood? <laughs> would you please just make it perfectly awesome all the time, consistently? Uh, but but the direction is stellar all the time. Uh, the cinematography is beautiful. The acting is brilliant. I, I almost think uh, Robin Wright steals the show in in some cases. She is just cold, menacing, and a hundred percent believable. The one thing that everybody that's been watching it at my household, and we have some family up this weekend who've been watching it too. Everybody's been debating whether they like the asides where Kevin Spacey breaks the fourth wall and turns to the camera. What do you think of that? Love it. Love it. Love it. Especially because it's not enough to hit you over the head with it. It's um, it reminds me of, and I thought it's kind of uh, appropriate that David Fincher is the one who's directing these because he of course did fight club. And I always loved the way fight club established the character of Tyler Durden, where first he shows up as this subliminal vision, but then uh, the, the unnamed narrator, Ed Norton, repeatedly turns to the camera as if he's there in all these situations, filling people in as to what Tyler Durden is about. To me, it's reminiscent of that, and I, I don't find it the least bit distracting, and especially especially because of how well they play the understated vibe of it. Like, there will be there will be half an episode where the only acknowledgement that only con that only connection that you get is maybe there's something he says earlier on 
about the way he thinks that lets you in. And then when something pays off with it, you just get one of these, one of these. You know, where he just looks over at the camera and that's all it takes. And I love it. Or he says something sincere, then turns to you and rolls his eyes. Love that stuff, too. I did think we were having this conversation after the first episode, particularly, that it was maybe used a little too much at first. Uh, but that may be a consequence of trying to establish that this is a normal thing. When it's used as sort of a replacement for voiceover when he's alone... I think it works beautifully when it's used in those little tiny instances like you're talking about where it's just kind of a nod to the to the viewer of like, check this, check what this, you know, is going on right here. I think it works beautifully. Eh, I, I felt like there were a couple instances where maybe it was a little clunky because there were people in the room almost still talking and he was turning to you. I'm not sure if I like that or not. But believe me, we're getting nit nit picky here on matters of taste. Overall, this is great. Let's 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 talk a little bit about the critical reception and what the media is saying. And, and Chad, I'm just going to run through these headlines. Uh, and then I want to kind of back out and be like, I, I have a theory about why we're getting all these headlines. So you get, you get your straight ahead headlines, like Netflix streaming first episode of house of cards for free, right? Just kind of emphasizing, Hey, you guys, this is a little taste of this. If you're not a Netflix subscriber, they obviously are trying to bring people into the tent uh, with this. Netflix raises more money for originals like house of cards. Netflix wants at least five new shows a year. The goal is to become HBO faster than HBO can become us. House of Cards, the 13-hour movie, defining the Netflix experience. Editorial, is that Kevin Spacey behind all those Apple products? Analysis, why Netflix must rethink binge viewing. And then uh, apparently some, some sort of... Uh, House of Cards viewer numbers in there as well that we'll talk about. But it, it goes all gamuts of like, this is the big gamble. They want to beat HBO at their own game. Uh, th this is the best thing ever. They're, they're, they're letting people just kind of watch on their own terms to Variety saying, this is, they're making the biggest mistake in the world by not doling this out one episode a week at a time. Yeah, well, and what's interesting, and of course, I'm sure Netflix love all this. You know, it, it doesn't matter what they're saying about you as long as, as, long as you're, they spell your name correctly and all that. Uh, I, I think that what we're seeing is, is weirdly something where nobody knows how they should react as consumers. Nobody knows how they should react as industry insiders. And weirdly, the only thing left to talk about is how you feel about the show, which is which is a place we've never been before. Like uh, when we talked about this yesterday on uh, This Week in Tech, uh, Father Robert Balasar really kind of blew my mind by pointing out how weird it is that for the first time, television content can be created in episodic format. Uh, I mean, outside of HBO, of course, but... but and Cinemax uh, and Showtime well, and Stars. Of, 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 of course. And but, the BBC. We're seeing, we're seeing a movement t towards, um, you know, what happens when... when you only are concerned with how the people like it at home. And it's like, I love this. It's, it's awesome. I think that the, the show is awesome. I think that, uh, uh, I, I think there is room to debate. We'll only know five, six weeks from now, whether or not it was a good idea to release everything at once and let everybody binge, or if they should have spread it out, as you know, uh, just Robert Young and I keep arguing about this back and forth. And, uh, and apparently at least a few people over at variety agree with just Robert Young uh, but wh what does your gut tell you? Is it better to encourage the binge experience or not? You know, I read this Variety article, uh, which is against the binge experience and tries to, to Andrew Wallenstein, uh, makes, I think, a very reasonable case of why this might be a bad idea for Netflix. But I, I was struck in reading it how all of the assumptions are based on the idea that Netflix is saying, we're changing our model. Now we have to put out a hit all the time to keep you coming. And Wallenstein is saying, if you let people binge on everything, then they're not going to stick with your service as long. Because once they've binged on all 13 episodes, then what's to keep them around? If you dole it out sh slowly, you'll keep them around for three months. That's where I think it's different from the HBO model. As far as creative control and not having to fit into a time slot and everything, it's really not that much different from what pay TV has done for a long time when you don't have, when you have non-commercials. HBO doesn't care about the ratings of girls. They're going to keep you in seasons because they think that they can build up a following around it, get people talking about it, getting people who want to subscribe to HBO. That's what Netflix is doing. They want people to come in for a house of cards. But at the same time, HBO isn't just going to air all 13 episodes of a season of girls right away because they do want to kind of keep you paying for the service, right? Netflix doesn't care about that. Remember, 
Netflix doesn't have a glut of good programming right now, and their subs are still going up. And well, remember that Netflix is still yet to get that exclusive Disney uh, deal, which is going to infuse them with a ton of great content. So House of Cards is just one piece in their strategy. It's not the only piece. And what, what everything I hear the Netflix folks saying is, we want you to think of Netflix as the place you go and watch whatever you want on your terms, and you don't have to go uh, to other places to watch this stuff. So I think it would be a mistake for House of Cards to be dealt out slowly because people would say, well, you know, what's the difference between this and, and, and another service? Now they're thinking, I love Netflix. I can do this with anything. And other people who may say, oh, I missed the first run of House of Cards. Well, forget it. Won't feel that way because down the road, they can go and binge on it whenever they want or watch as much of it as they want. It's, it's an entirely different model. Right. Well, and there's two factors here. One is the fact that uh, if they did release uh, weekly episodic content, then I honestly feel like a lot of people who don't have Netflix would say, well, I'll just wait until they're all out and then sit down mm -hmm. and watch them at once, which would in every way be the opposite of what Netflix wants. Second of all, uh, the, the binging experience is what it, it is. Uh, Netflix's USP, its unique selling proposition. And so as such, they've got to encourage that, that, that method and, and that, that form of, of transforming the way, or at least acknowledging the way most people like to watch their television. Uh, finally, here's the important thing. By releasing all at once, they're able to do something that sounds ridiculous, sounds like a bad idea for Netflix to do, but they can say, House of Cards is out. You can watch all of it for free. While you're at it, get all the way caught up on Breaking Bad, get as much Walking Dead in as you can, and then cancel. We double dog dare you because nobody will cancel once they sign up. And I know, yes, everyone says, well, I canceled and then I went back or whatever. Very, very few people, once they sign up, once they give a credit card, once they get into it, once they go through it, it's very hard to uh, cancel from a service. There's, I still pay for so many stupid things that are $7.99 per month because I just can't be bothered to undo it. And you never know, maybe this week I'll actually start using my MOG service more than I do. As best I could tell, I've paid $180 for three albums on MOG just because I can't be bothered to get around to unsubscribing from the service. And that's what Netflix needs to do is get everybody trying stuff under the auspices of it being free. And the, the old model was we've got some leverage over people because they don't have much of a choice. So let's try to get them to do what is good for us. Let's try to get all of them to watch on Sunday night. That way we can sell ads into this. Let's try to push for ratings. Let's try to manipulate behavior so that it helps our business model. And I think that's what you see in Wallenstein's article in Variety. And the reality is Netflix says our business model is not predicated on trying to manipulate you into doing anything. Our business model is you pay us a very small amount of money a month, $8, and we will let you watch whatever you want, wherever you want, whenever you want. You can I'll watch it what, on your man. tablet, it on is... your laptop, all of that stuff. And you can watch any of the shows we have as long as we have them available. It is astonishing to me how fast your attitude changes about spending $7.99 a month on something once you've bought an airport beer, like just once. Like once you <laughs> bought one of those beers and it's $9, you're like, dude, I paid $9 for a beer. Yes, I'll pay for a month of Netflix. Well, and and over. the other thing about Netflix, too, is uh, it, it's not scarcity. Uh, you pay for HBO. You can only watch what's on HBO. Now, that's changing with HBO Go. I get that, right? And that's that's the whole, that's what all these articles about Netflix wants to be HBO before HBO becomes them are about, right? HBO is starting to get that, oh, we need to make it easy for people to watch our shows whenever they want as well. But Fact of the matter is most people who watch HBO or Showtime or any of those kind of channels can really only watch what's on the channel. Right. And what Netflix says is we don't have that issue. We're not There's, a there, channel. We're a there brand. There is no is day what they So it wouldn't make any sense to the audience if suddenly they're like, well, here's episode one of House of Cards. They'd be like, well, if you've got them all done... Why not just let me watch them like you want, like everything else? It's not like you're doling out. You know, the, it would almost be like saying, well, when they get this, the season of Breaking Bad, they should dole it out one at a time, just like the syndicated channels do. Right. It, it doesn't so it, Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let, let's burn through some of these issues that we got. First of all, we got Netflix releasing the first episode for free, which is smart. If you ask me, they should release the first three episodes for free because if you're in it by the third episode, I don't know, maybe, maybe the first one alone is First one was pretty good, but as with many television shows, it didn't really get its hooks into me until it's about as far as you are in right now, Tom. What do you think? Uh, no, I, I got its hooks into me about two-thirds of the way through the first episode and then definitely after the second episode. So I, I think the, the first one free is a, is a great 
idea. It can't hurt them. Uh, it's a good teaser that they can do. You know, putting up the first episode of somebody else's show uh, is not nearly as compelling as this is the only place you can watch this. So, hey, yep. you know what? It's no different than somebody putting up a pilot on iTunes for free download to try to get you to want to watch or buy the rest of that season. Okay, so Netflix raising money for more originals like this. I think this is a slam dunk, right? If the problem is, and we've talked about this metaphor before that I keep harping on, I don't know if you're a fan of it or not, but the idea of these networks going around on the Monopoly board, grabbing all the properties they can, uh, if you have the ability to pull an HBO to be a hit-making franchise, I mean, at that point, you're printing your own properties, and that's that's the way to go. I think this is a slam dunk and an obvious investment, even though it's a very costly one for them. I mean, we're talking about, like, what, $250 million to be spent on more stuff? Yeah, well, and Netflix also gets the advantage of, uh, you know, being involved in a, in a little bit of licensing deals. Uh, they, you know, they, they have a lots of rights that they wouldn't have to something acquired. So I think that makes sense. What do you think of Sharice Sark's uh, article that the product placement just drives him nuts? No, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't disagree more. I didn't even because- notice it. I uh, noticed no. it once when they kind of lingered on the Apple logo on an iPhone a little longer than maybe I would have otherwise. But I find it much, much more distracting when people go out of their way to generify regular objects on there. When somebody's holding, you know, cola brand cola or beer brand beer, that drives me nuts. This is supposed to be the real world. And spoiler alert, these are probably the actual computers that they're using up on Capitol Hill. If you were to think of it in these terms, then all of This Week in Tech, all of Twit is nothing but a giant paid shill for Apple, if you think about it that way. But the fact or is- Or Heil. These, these, yes, exactly. We're all, we're all paid shills for Heil microphones, which are fine. And I actually love my PR40. Thank you very much. You know, I love life. my PR40. I'll, I'll be a shill for it. I paid for this <laughs> thing myself too. So I paid myself to be a shill. But in that case, uh, I mean, look, this is um, uh, there are things that uh, maybe do feel a little bit hand handed when you hear uh, a senator or, or a congressman say, is that a PS Vita? Uh, but uh, there are so many little moments of kind of fan service where they acknowledge the type of people who are watching this. The type of people who are watching this are the Netflix, the, the tech savvy, cord cutting possibly type crowd. And they are the ones who get off on seeing the demise of the newspaper well, industry. What about that they paid product things. placement for CNN or that paid product placement for ABC? Did you notice sure. that they don't have generic cable television or or just the news outlet that's affiliated with the company that's uh, airing the show? Because they sure. have no network execs. That was the one thing that, that I know uh, that these guys wanted when they went with Netflix is there's no one upstairs telling them what they can and can't tell in this story. Netflix right. just says, make it, we'll buy it. That's it. Usually Which, you have to run it upstairs, run it by executives, get notes. So when they want to have John King on from CNN, they get John King from CNN on. As long as they can book him, it's fine. I'm sure they had exactly. to get CNN's permission to use that logo. But outside of that, there was no network exec going, you know, uh, that, that's the competition and we really don't want to be emphasizing them. So, you know, it's it, and and that could be happening with the tech as well. I think I think it's all more realistic that way. And I, I agree with you on that. Well, And even if it is, pan like, if it's anything, it's pandering to a certain fan base. Mention Twitter more. Show more new media versus old media. Throw in a game. Make him a gamer, even though it's highly unlikely someone who's 59 years old would love to play Call of Duty. Whatever. And it's Why like, is that unlikely? I actually found that one of the things that I was like, no, this is actually probably more I, true than people realize. Dude, I agree. Look, but you and I are the base, right? I'm saying if there is an offense, I doubt it's selling out to make a profit. I, I believe the only offense that you could level at them is that you are cheaply trying to appeal to the type of people who are watching this show. And if that's the case, then bring on more of that because I love being treated with respect and having things that I believe represented in a way that I thought looked realistic. All right. I'm sure we could talk about House of Cards pretty much all day. So we should probably move on because we have another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. YouTube uh, reported to be launching paid channel subscriptions, according to Ad Age. 
Uh, the idea would be that their partner channels, uh, like Geek and Sundry, which I do the Sword and Laser show for, or uh, like iJustine, uh, those kinds of people could charge for either all of their channel or portions of their channel. Uh, the Ad Age article says somewhere between $1 and $5 a month. They might even be able to, uh, to ha still run ads in the channel, even if they're charging. Uh, and this would all be done as an experiment with uh, the idea of finding out if there's money to be made by doing pay-per-view, essentially. I think this is an extraordinarily important advancement that will fundamentally shift the calculus for many content creators to figure out a way to remain independent. Uh, and I'm dealing with this personally right now. Uh, this this is going to be a full... I'm about to go on in full-on full personal promotion mode here, Tom, so be be. Be cool with me for a moment. Uh, so I, I do scam school where we teach bar tricks, but all of scam school's tricks have to be dead simple so that you can be half drunk at the bar and remember them and have a chance of pulling it off. If I were to teach real sleight of hand on uh, scam school, it would be problematic because nobody would actually be doing the tricks. They're too complicated and magicians would, no lie, freak out and, and shout exposure and say that I'm harming the art of magic. I'm giving away all the secrets wholesale. Uh, but if, if, and if we have any fans, any people we know over at YouTube who might be able to make this happen, if I had the opportunity to create a sub channel where it's like Brian teaches magic and it's like, you just got to pay an entry fee at the door to get in. There's an entire different class of magic that I could teach because there would be this, um, uh, much as, you know, if you care enough to buy the book, then you care enough to learn the magic trick, that kind of thing. This would placate all the magicians and it would allow me to, to do a type of teaching that I just can't do on Scam School. And right now, we had to make the decision. Uh, as you know, I've, I've promoted that, that we're launching Scam Stuff, which is a place for you, know, you to buy actual magic stuff. So I created a 23-minute a um, tutorial teaching some basic sleight of hand for, for the three-coin trick. It's uh, one of the fundamentals that most people who learn good magic learn. But uh, I, I wanted to charge for it and because I, I wanted to make it longer and more boring than a Scam School episode. Uh, but unfortunately, when it came to distribution, I looked into it. I was like, is there a way where they could just buy a license and then they can see it anytime they want or stream it? It's so inconvenient to have to download a 500 megabyte file and hope you don't lose it because this is your one digital copy of this thing. I want it to be free. I want it to be out there. I want it to be easy to get. But there, the only way for me to do it now is put it out, and I'm, I'm aware that somebody's going to put it up on BitTorrent in about two seconds, and that there's going to be a whole class of people that I never really reach correctly. But unfortunately, I'm stuck in this position of having to send out a digital copy of this lesson and just uh, and, and deal with all the DRM issues, and I don't want that. If there, was a, if there was a clubhouse I can make that was a $5 a month entry free, and you get unlimited Brian teaching you stuff one-on-one, -on -one, then I would do that in a heartbeat. And I think that uh, there's got to be all other kinds of niches that I'm not even thinking of that YouTube could try to could tap into if they pull this off. Well, I, I, and I, th I think that's a good personal story. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, when you say, I wish I knew somebody at YouTube, there's plenty of people in the audience know my wife works at YouTube. Uh, now, you know so what's funny I, is I was actually making a plea to somebody. I was hoping that somebody in a position to do this listening, that was... As I said, yeah, no, I no, no, but I want to make I clear that there. that's not the person that can make this decision for Brian. Correct, correct, yes. Uh, and also that I, I don't have any inside information about this story uh, because of that. Also, I, I think in some ways your situation is very unique and not that many people have that magic concern per se. Uh, on the other hand, I think your desire for just having an easy way to put it up there in charge is, is probably very widespread. However... Well, listen to the way you said it. Oh, well, somebody's going to take the episode and put it up on BitTorrent. That's going to happen with YouTube. It is easy to download a video uh, from YouTube and post it somewhere else. But, but, you know, don't, don't fall into the trap of thinking like, oh, because it's behind YouTube's wall, it's secure. Of course not. No, uh, it's of course it's not, not secure. But, but what I want is I want it to be easier to make the decision once to join my right. clubhouse. And now that's it's what it's about. Because you're YouTube. actually going to deal with more restrictive policies and DRM when you play in YouTube's area than if you just did it yourself. But but you have that. But why YouTube is success is successful is because even though they have these restrictions when you play in their in their world, they make so many other things easy that it's worth putting up with the restrictions. And so if they stuff. if they had an easy paywall there that people trusted 
And they said, right. oh, I'll pay Google. I pay Google for all kinds of things on Android and elsewhere. So, yeah, I'll give them $5. Brian Brushwood's personal website, I don't know if I want to give him a credit card there or not, right? Sure. I mean, well, it's that kind it of stuff, way. too. So one of the biggest strengths of YouTube's brand, uh, of its content, some of the most popular things are tutorials of all variety, whether it's Photoshop tutorials, whether it's makeup tutorials, and there's different levels of expertise. And there's going to be a free level that anyone can put out there. But then there's going to be personalities that you, that that who have built their brand as the most trusted, who want to do more advanced things. And it's not, you know, I, I obviously have the secrecy issue with magic, but but there are other people who who are qualified. You know, like if you charged me five dollars, I would pay you five dollars for this tutorial. But there's no infrastructure to take advantage of that, and this is something that can make a very big difference for content producers. Uh, I, I fully expect to see it. In fact, YouTube's uh, response to ad age was essentially like, hey, we're always experimenting with lots of new pay models. So non-denial, denial. denial. Uh, in fact, I don't even think they were trying to deny it. I think they were just basically like, we don't have anything to announce at this time. But yeah, sure. Are we always looking for new ways to make money? We're going to try all kinds of things. That, that seemed to be the response there. This right. episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5. Now, what's interesting regarding our previous conversation here is that Pond5 is the world's stock media marketplace. And I know a lot of you in the audience are now thinking like, wait a minute, how can I make money off of putting my stuff online? Because I make stuff. In fact, there are people in the chat room like, can I change it over time? Can I, can I have one episode be 10 cents and then then later when, when I get really popular, raise it to a dollar? Everybody wants to make money off their stuff, but you don't want to spend money making it. That's what Pond5 is amazing about. You get very affordable stock video. You get very affordable sound effects, photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, all the things you need to make your creative enterprise uh, and royalty-free. You, you buy it, you can use it in, legally in almost any situation you can think of. So go you know to what? Pond5, P-O-N-D-5.com slash frame rate and get 50 free stock media files. So what's interesting is we're entering an age when a lot of people for the last five years have been dabbling with content creation. But now I think a lot of those people, including the folks who are listening and watching frame rate, uh, are would like to start making money. And the rules all change when you're making money on something. And Pond5, of course, is high quality. Of course, it's 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 an open marketplace. You can get whatever you want. But more importantly, you know, you could trust them that you now own the IP and you don't have to sweat it. When they have the checkbox and you don't know if something's going to come back to haunt you, get it from Pond5 and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Pond5.com slash frame rate. You can even sell your stuff. If you've got some stock video, you're like, actually, I got some pretty good helicopter shots. It doesn't even have to be helicopter shots. It could be anything. B-roll. People are always looking for B-roll of all kinds of things. Maybe you live next to a, a nest of crocodiles. Go shoot some video of that stuff. Put it up on Pond5. Make some money. They pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale. Once again, 50 free stock media files, pond5.com slash frame rate. And we thank them for their support of frame rate and crocodile nest liver next tours everywhere. Shall we slip into the street? <laughs> Chad wasn't nothing. waiting, man. You took He's too like, long. No. You took too long. And Chad He's like, was no, just you like, got close nothing. Close it up. You got nothing. I'm playing. <laughs> Thank you, actually. You saved me. Uh, because our first story is about Blockbuster. Yeah. Blockbuster on demand. Give it at the old college try. Uh, Blockbuster is owned by Dish. And uh, Blockbuster on demand is relaunched again. This time with 1080p, 5.1 surround sound, apps for the Samsung Smart TV, Android, and Roku 2 boxes. Uh, they They're don't have an iOS the story, app. Though. The story is that Blockbuster is still around. That's adorable. But I kind of implied that, didn't I? Did, I, did we no, have no, to? I, did I, we I, have I, to? Do we have to I go said, there? Do we have to hey, beat that dead horse? Yes, we do. Uh, but <sighs> you know, but just give it a rest, Blockbuster hater. <laughs> ironically like it's easy to, to to roll your eyes but it's like you know we we make it very clear that the more players in this space the better it is for us consumers here so i for one welcome our new underdogs i guess the point i was trying to make is they're they're better than they've ever been they've tried block, yes. the blockbuster brand millions of times they've tried all these on demand and it's good they're on the roku they're on android but they're not on ios uh and they pretty much emphasize desktop viewing over mobile viewing which is kind of kind of reverse uh there's no way to watch hd video mobile for instance um so they've got some idiosyncrasies on it. Don't, don't harp on them yeah all right now i'll stop being the blockbuster hater uh how about being an amazon hater if you love downton abbey but you don't want to get amazon prime you're going to be sol starting june 18th when in the united states anyway 
Amazon's exclusive deal with PBS brings Downton Abbey season three only to Amazon Prime streaming and all of the back seasons as well. Uh, and this also will apply to seasons four and seasons five if they do a fifth season. They are going to do a fourth season. So Downton Abbey streaming anyway, not not on demand, but streaming. You want to you want to stream it? You're going to have to get Amazon Prime starting June 18th. Dude, uh, the more I the more I'm thinking about it, the more I think this metaphor with the Monopoly board is perfect. Like they just locked in a monopoly. Now they're building hotels on Downton Abbey. They're 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 charging rents. Yeah, though I mean we talked about this on this week in tech this week. Uh, and I don't want to go over too much of that ground because I know we have some people who watch both shows, but I don't see this as any different than what, in fact, it's still better than what we already have. What yes. we already have is, you know, HBO locks up some of the movies and a bunch of the shows. And and then you have Stars locks up a bunch of the movies. And then the shows get syndicated and only sci-fi has them for a while. And then they go to the BBC America channel. and then But then they go to TNT. Uh, the, the Most of the shows are available on multiple services. So the idea of, one service to rule them all, I'm not worried about yet. What I'm worried about is discoverability. We need that TV guide for these services. And there are some good approximations like Clicker out there, but I don't think anybody's cracked it quite yet. Digit's doing some interesting stuff. Keep an eye on them as well. But uh, but I don't mind Amazon getting an exclusive. Do you? I, I, do, I already said if, if, if it could be uh, that, that HBO Go and Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime divvied up all the money I ever spent on video, that would be okay as long as it wasn't going to Time Warner Cable. That would be awesome. What about Twitch charging $9 a month for the premium tier, which takes away the commercials but also gives you custom emoticons, badges, and, and some other nifty little things when you're watching people on Twitch? You've, you've done some Twitch stuff, right? Yeah, well, and, and actually, Twitch, I believe, uses the same engine as uh, Justin.tv. So uh, yeah, I do all my Justin, stuff. On, so, yeah, yeah Justin.tv slash Scam School Brian, I do a bunch of stuff. Um, it, it was not clear to me at first when I read the headline. I thought, oh, man, if I sign that up, then none of my viewers have to watch ads. And then I realized, I don't think that's what it's saying. It's saying that you don't have to watch ads if you're paying eight ninety nine dollars a month. Is that correct? Right, right, right. Most people, nah, I mean, yes, I'll say this. Most people don't stream on Twitch. So the play is to the consumers of Twitch, although so many people stream on Twitch. I almost feel comfortable saying that. But this is yeah. saying if you pay $9 a month when you watch Twitch, you won't have to pay the ads. Now, the one thing you may think of was, well, wait a minute. I know that Brian makes some money off of the ads that run on his stream. I don't want to rip him off. You won't. Uh -huh. Twitch says they're still going to pay the same amount per stream to the content creators that they pay now, whether the person is a paid subscriber or a free subscriber, because they're getting the money either way. Yeah. The uh, in fact, actually, here I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, just hours before we went live, I got an email. Hey, it's a right spike attack here. Uh, oh no, I have to be logged in. Okay, so uh, but the the custom emoticons are pretty cool because like you basically type in a code word and then it displays a picture in the Justin TV chat. Um, obviously not for everyone on regular IRC, but uh, but in there, I'm gonna see if I could get this one to work. They told me like just an hour ago that the Brian Brushwood custom emoticon was was put together. Nice, here. that's awesome. Uh, Sky uh, with their Now TV service has has been kind of leading the way into selling you internet TV over the uh, internet. In other words, the kind of TV you would get over cable, over Sky's satellite service normally, over the internet. The big complaint has always been, well, but I can't get sports. Or if I can get sports online, my local teams are always blacked out. Starting uh, soon, Sky is announcing that now TV service members can get Premier League football, that's soccer to you in the United States, and other major sporting events for 10 pounds a day. Now, it's not an ongoing subscription. It's basically, you want to watch something that's happening today? You pay 10 pounds, you can watch all the sports that are happening on that day. So if you got two events happening on the same day, you still only pay 10 pounds. This seems like a uh, reasonable amount because most of the people doing this are going to be hosting parties, they're going to have friends over, or they're just going to be so passionate that... They would rather spend, you know, essentially $20 American and stay at home rather than go to the local pub to watch these things. I think this is great. Yeah, it's, it depends on how much you consume sports, right? Because you have to pay 15 pounds for the Now TV per month cost uh, if you're not a Sky TV subscriber already. So that's that's the way you get your internet TV direct. Then you got to pay 10 pounds. Let's say there's three or four matches. Uh, you pay around 40 pounds if you're a heavy uh, consumer 
uh, of stuff per month. That starts to be about the same as, well, it's for, actually more than the 42 pounds, 50 pence that you would pay for your per month minimum 12 month Sky TV subscription. So right. it depends. To me, it becomes a play for convenience. It's somebody who's like, you know what? I just want the choice to be able to decide what days I want to pay for sports and what days I don't. And I don't want to hook up a service. I sure. don't want to pay for channels I don't get. So I'm going to go with Now TV. Uh, but this is much farther down the road than most other cable services, which are doing TV everywhere. You have to be a regular subscriber. There's This is the only major cable television service that I know of that offers you an internet only experience. That's awesome, man. Uh, by the way, quick update. Uh, apparently in the chat over at justin.tv slash Gamesco Brian, they figured out how to make the custom Brian icon work. You have to type spike attack with this capital S and a capital A, and it replaces it with me screaming at you. <laughs> Excellent. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Love Film has signed a deal with Disney to add Marvel animated TV shows to its UK instant streaming catalog. I guess the significance of this is Netflix has the exclusive on Disney stuff, like Iron Man movies, in the United States. Love Film, an Amazon company, now has a deal with Disney in the UK. Now, it's not the exact same deal. It doesn't include all the live action films, but it does include a lot of the back catalog uh, that would normally be in the United States anyway, exclusive to Netflix. Yeah, it, it, I don't know if that's weird or not. I guess I guess it's weird because I know there's a Netflix in the UK. Uh, uh, you know, obviously Love Film is farther along than they are. Uh, and I guess I wouldn't expect them to do anything but work with whoever has the distribution right now. But for some reason, I would just assume like, well, now you're in the family and you got to be on our team. But I guess that's not the case there. I mean, it's good for consumers. Don't get me wrong. Well, wait, what do you, you're saying? Love Film is Amazon, not Netflix. Right. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying is because Netflix, well, Netflix has the deal with Disney here in the United States. Correct. And Disney owns Marvel. So I would have expected that Marvel, a Disney company, would have a reason to no, work but the with Disney deal Netflix with Netflix is only there. in the United States. So now Netflix could have negotiated this deal in the UK, but Disney's saying, eh, Love Film made a better deal. Sorry. We're giving this All we're right. giving this stuff to Love Film. You know? All it's right. not yeah. if if Netflix wanted the worldwide rights, they would have had to pay for them. That's all. Fair enough. Yeah. Let's move on to tube tops. Tube tops, of course, all about set top box stuff. This news seems more and more to come in very big spurts. Uh, we yeah. get like lots of set-top box news at once, and then we don't get anything. It just kind of trickles around for a while. Not this much to say today. Week. Yeah. Yeah. At, there's a rumor, Bloomberg reporting, that Apple TV will start carrying the HBO Go app later this year. That'd be a big plus for Apple TV users if you're on a service that will allow it. See, the, the problem is not every service allows all the HBO Go apps to work. I'm on Direct you, TV. HBO Go works fine on my iPad, but it does not work on Roku. So, have you uh, been contacted by any mutual acquaintances looking to trade in the black market of HBO Go logins? Oh yeah, I've been approached by lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting to see this start to develop. At some point, yeah. there's going to be significant lost revenue for HBO, and it'll be worth it for them to go ahead and offer that legitimately. But I do find that interesting that as it starts to become more and more obvious that the hiccup is no longer the devices, the hiccup's no longer HBO's willingness to let you watch it, the hiccup is going to be what service you're on. You know, I think, uh, is it Comcast that doesn't do HBO Go? I, I don't know. They don't do it at all. That's, I know Verizon, what, Verizon Fios does it, does everything. They're like, whatever, wherever there's an HBO Go app, we're in. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know that uh, from what I understand, Time Warner Cable is cool like that too, but uh, but a certain mutual acquaintance. Most of them, but not all of them. Looking to deal in black market HBO Go passwords may have expressed to me some frustrations about his cable company. If it was a person who was a boy. I see. If it was Max Trollbot. It, uh, yes. There's, uh, well, and there's also the idea of this that, hey, if Apple's talking to HBO about things, does that mean there's an Apple television? To, you know, pe people could start to stretch this. This is a rumor. Let's not get carried away with it. Uh, the right. only other uh, tube top story we have to talk about, XBMC has released XBMC 12 Frodo, which includes HD audio support, including DTSMA and Dolby True HD. Uh, they also have live TV and PVR support. 
uh, H.264 10-bit, 64-bit support in OS 10 to match the 64-bit support in Linux. Uh, improved image support, support for the Raspberry Pi. Want to put XBMC on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, some initial support for Android and improved AirPlay. So if you are an XBMC user, go get Frodo. It's for real and released. I know we've talked about it before, but now it's, it's not just in beta anymore. Now, what if shout I wanted to shout to the world, like, how great Frodo was, and I needed some kind of platform where, and I want, I want to look legit. I don't want to be, like, some fly-by-night HTML coded on a notepad document. I want something that looks like I paid a bajillion dollars to an artist to really get my message, like, Frodo freed on XBMC. How would I get that out there? Frodo, Frodo lives, maybe? Are you talking about Frodo the Hobbit or Frodo the XBMC installation? I'm gonna, no, it's actually Frodo uh, the homeless man who lives down the street from me. Oh, he, he, well. His name is Fro space Doe. It's, uh, it, it's short for Doolittle. He used to be, you know, Froetius Doolittle, but now we call him Frodo for short. I want everyone to know that he lives. He's just down yeah. the road. You know, I, I don't even know why I bothered to clarify because the answer is the same in all three cases, whether you're talking about the Hobbit or whether you're talking about the XBMC install or the guy named Froetius down the street from Brian Brushwood, you can make a brilliant, wonderful-looking website to shout Frodo lives to the world at squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. Get all those pictures of Frodo and put them up on the website. And don't worry that it's going to look weird if somebody's looking at your website on a smartphone because they've got mobile responsive designs. It makes those beautiful templates, those award-winning designs that you can use and people think you did. You don't have to tell them it was Squarespace. Just say, oh, yeah, I designed it myself. And it will it will adjust that template. So if somebody's on a tablet, somebody's on a, on a phone, somebody's on a laptop, the site looks beautiful in all of those cases. And it's fast. It's easy to use. You've probably used some kind of content management system, some kind of posting system in the past, which just gave you a headache. Uh, this is beautiful drag and drop functionality for all your customization tools. New page builder tool called Layout Engine enables you to customize pages in seconds. You just add blocks of content where you want. You think about what you want to say about Frodo. You don't worry about what the page is going to look like because you're just putting it right where you want it to be. Squarespace gives you better social media integration, great design, and you know how much you're going to have to pay to try it out, Brian? Uh, it's like usually most of these trials, it's like a billion of dollars or you got to give like the, you got to name your child after I forget. What, what is it? You know, even Frodo could afford it because it's free. What? No credit card. No, you don't even need a credit card. Uh, you, I was if you don't say like Frodo wouldn't have a credit card, so he wouldn't nope. even be able to pass the lock, but he wouldn't even need one. He He'd just be still like, try it out and start building a website. Uh, if he decided, or you decided to purchase it for him. Don't forget the offer code frame rate two. That gives you 10% off on your first purchase on new accounts. Be they monthly or yearly. Yearly, you get 10% off the entire year. I'm just saying. So check it out. Squarespace.com. Use that offer code frame rate two. We thank them for their support of This Week in Tech. I'm right kidding. On. It's frame rate. See, I just, that was a callback. Oh, dude, I, oh see, I was not there. I was, I was already on to the, I was already thinking about film phone. Film fam, all about things you love to watch. Did you check out C299792 kilometers per second, Brian? Uh, wow, did I miss this story? Because I have no idea what you're talking about. Fill me in here, man. Okay, this was a Kickstarter-backed uh, film. Project was funded in December 2011. Uh, it's a 15-minute film. Budget of $40,000, finally out and available on Vimeo. And it is just gorgeous. Uh, it's 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 about a mining ship or a warship. I'm not quite sure. It's a little bit of both. Uh, and, but director Derek Van Gorder used a very low budget tricks to make this film just look amazing. Uh, took advantage of the low light capabilities of digital cameras uh, to make it look dark and brooding. Team used dim colored lights to set the mood and hide the low budget set. Used projectors for the ship's user interfaces and for nearby planets. Uh, and the warship was created using a combination of 3D models, laser cut parts, and various pieces from other modeling kits. Yeah, there's this kind of fake 70s documentary at the beginning. Oh, that you this skip is in. awesome. Look at this. This looks amazing. Looking I down love this. this like, uh, you know, space age hall. Just clever shots, clever, good cinematography. 
Uh, it and and a pretty good story actually. I mean, I wasn't sure. Sometimes I'm like, I'll watch these things anyway, just because they're pretty. But I got sucked right. into this story. I want to hear. I want to see more. I want to see what happens next. Right on. Well, I, I guess if you just uh, look, uh, it's it's C as in the speed of light, right? right. Two hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred seventy two kilometers per second. So if you just do like C speed of light movie, I guess search for that. Yeah. Uh, or, or check out the show notes, twit.tv slash FR. We'll put it in the links there, too, as well. That's Amazon has greenlit five new children's pilots, so they now have 11 in-production pilots. It's a little complicated to follow what's going on at Amazon Studios because you may be like, well, no, I've heard, I've heard they approved children's things before. They have uh, optioned some children's shows before. Uh, they've approved scripts for children's forms, but these are the first pilots that they've greenlighted for production. Uh, and there's uh, some pretty interesting stuff. Did you look all this stuff? It's all uh, it's all preschool stuff, I think. And I, people to, like to, people involved in Blues Clues and stuff are involved. Yeah, to be honest, it's like the moment I saw that it was for children, I was like, I'm sure I'll see all of them a lot. And for some reason, it didn't occur to me because what often happens with these is you see titles and ideas that don't mean anything to you yet, you know. And so uh, uh, but I'm sure I'll be watching a lot of them because my kids watch a lot of this. Creative Galaxy, an animated interactive art adventure, Oz Adventures, a, a innovative problem-solving series, Teeny Tiny Dogs, produced by the Jim Henson Company, uh, Tumbly, aimed at preschoolers, set in a whimsical land with a small blue fox, uh, and the untitled J.J. Johnson Project, which resolves around yeah, Anne, a young scientist who, ha who uh, creates three robot helpers. That's probably sounds like my favorite of the whole bunch. Right on. <laughs> Uh, we got more Star Wars news. Gonna be, I think it's going to be Star Wars news every week from now until 2015 or beyond because the news this time is that Kathleen Kennedy saying, look, yeah, sure, maybe 2015, but we're not committed to that. We want to get the story right. So however long it takes to get this thing into production, that's how long it's going to take. Don't hold us to 2015. It might be later. I think it's because they got J.J. Abrams on board and they know how busy he is. Yeah, uh, partly that, but it could be, here's a nutty idea. Maybe she's actually committed to making it good, and maybe they don't want to be tied down regardless of who's in charge of it. And uh, I would rather hear this. I've never had a problem with video game developers who put a release date of when it's done because that shows, uh, whether or not it's accurate, it shows a an outward commitment to the level of quality of product. And that's the only thing I want to see out of this Disney acquisition of the Star Wars franchise is just make them good again because... For a decade, it's been a national nightmare. It's been my childhood held hostage. Day 3,699. <laughs> now, did you ever see Moon with Sam Rockwell or maybe did Source I? Code with Jake Gyllenhaal? Did you see either one of those? Watch, I watched Moon like repeatedly on Netflix. It's amazing. I loved the retro 1970s sci-fi. The, the Sam Rockwell's performance was nothing short of amazing. It was astonishing. And uh, Source Code was one of the first movies ever bought in the uh, summer movie draft. It was the year it came out. It was one of the ones that was part of my slate, I believe, the year I won. Did you see it? Oh, yeah. It was cute. Okay. It was good. smaller scale. Uh, well, like Duncan it. Jones, director of both those movies, has been signed on to direct the World of Warcraft movie. Yeah, man. And what's weird is he's, like, seriously committed to making a good video game movie. What was the tweet he put out? Like, uh, people say you so can't make So the gauntlet a was thrown down ages ago. Can you make a proper movie of a video game? I've always said it's possible. Got to do it now. Now, keep in mind that this is... Uh, do, you, uh, do you realize, like, what the number one... Uh, like, the best voted or the best reviewed video game movie out there? It might have... I think it's the Silent Hill movie. Is the closest thing to a good science fiction movie as far as Rotten Tomatoes reviews. Number two Better is like Prince of Persia. Prince, <laughs> Prince of Persia is uh, like at 60% at fresh or 46%. I forget what these are. Go look up the numbers. But it's astonishing for to go to Rotten Tomatoes and look and sort by video game movies by quality. It's ridiculous. And apparently uh, Charles Levitt wrote the script uh, originally when Sam Raimi was attached to the project. Uh, and they're keeping... That script under wraps, uh, but uh, they're they're targeting a 2015 release. Yeah, man, and they got a hundred million dollars. I don't know. That's, the, that's actually the only thing I'm worried about. Duncan Jones, I don't think is ever. I mean, it's like they're like 35 million from for Source Code, something like that. Yeah. So uh, Source Code's barely barely made a profit domestically, but uh, but he makes the most out of out of what he can use. He gets a lot of mileage. Well, that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. If he gets a hundred million dollars. <laughs> He might well, get I mean, lazy or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but you know, I mean, fully, fully half it's going to go to visual effects designers and, and computer right. generation. I mean, a lot of that stuff is just expensive. Well, I think but also, manage it well. 
they have they have a lot of that in house at Blizzard. They make some amazing, uh, you know, uh, the cinematics that that go with the releases. So does Blizzard do all those in house? Because I know a lot of video game companies will outsource those to they, firms. That I I may be mistaken, and I'm willing to admit my my wrong. But I am a, I am under the, of the understanding that they do those in house. Yeah. Uh, well, dude, it's it was uh, they are amazing. You know, I'm a big fan of video game cinematics, and they yeah. always do good ones. Uh, finally, there is a trailer up on YouTube for the second season of Charlie Brooker's Black Mirror. Uh, go ahead and play a little bit with the sound up here, Chad. More. Travel more. Share more. Smile more. Find more. Consume more. Think more. Experience more. Remember more. See more. Share more. Remember more. Learn more. Make more. Play more. Make more. Connect more. 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 I tell you, almost every time I see this, I think I'm watching the pre-roll at first. It Yo, just because it looks so nailed. yeah sure the feeling of one of those smartphone ads and well, then and it, it just looks, takes that twist that slow it, twist well especially like it, my favorite is the audio cue because you hear what sounds like a generic announcer and i can't tell the moment it changed but it starts to sound more and more like a synthetic robot voice you know giving commands uh, i have no idea what the show's about but i know that i liked what i saw it had a very um uh, they live kind of feel. Obey this giant. is the second series. Uh, Charlie Brooker has explained the series. Uh, he told The Guardian, if technology is a drug and it does feel like a drug, then what precisely are the side effects? This area between delight and discomfort is where Black Mirror is set. The Black Mirror of the title is the one you'll find on every wall, on every desk, in the palm of every hand, the cold, shiny screen of a television, a monitor, or a smartphone. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. I can't believe I, mean, I missed series one. I gotta go. I gotta go catch up and get ready for uh, the second season because this this looks like a, a definite, definite hit. Absolutely. Hey, uh, is see, anything let's... premiering this week? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe premiering this week. This is what's premiering this week. Check it out. Yeah, aren't you glad that we got that fine, fancy bumper in there to, to talk yeah. about these fine movies? What do we got well, coming up? Side Effects actually has got 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, so it might be worth uh, premiering this week. It's a thriller about Emily and Martin, a successful New York company who, couple whose world unravels when a new drug prescribed by Emily's psychiatrist intended to treat anxiety has other effects that are not listed on the page I'm looking at. Also, The Sorcerer and the White Snake, which is uh, based on Chinese fantasy, is out as well. Not about the 80s band. Here I go again on my own. Bad. Going Let's down see. the only road I ever known. Hey, uh, Brian? Yeah? What are we watching? What we're watching. Uh, dude, I'm watching, of course, House of Cards, diving all the way in. Uh, I started watching, I saw that Louie was on uh, Netflix, and everyone says good things about Louie. Watched the first episode of that, and it felt very piloty. And, of course, it said, you know, edited by Louis C.K., and I was like, well, maybe it's just a very pilot, very disjointed. You could tell he had, like, three funny vignettes in his mind and threw it together. And I watched the second one was better, still not sold on the reputation that Louis has relative to what I'm seeing in the first two episodes. But I'll dive in, go through the rest of those. I also watched the um, the documentary on the making of Nevermind that was uh, uh, the Nirvana album. I believe it was partially financed by um, uh, Dave Grohl, and uh, who appears in there along with the other uh, – uh, I was cast members, band members. Uh, and uh, it's it's really hot and cold. There's moments where I'm just like, okay, this is a documentary, really. But then there's other moments when you get a, a slice of what really went into that album while they were making it and the, and the ideas behind the sound design where you feel like you're just peeking in on a little chunk of true music history. So I would say, I would say definitely check that out. I dug that. You know, the only negative response I have to that recommendation, because I, I saw uh, the uh, the Experience Music Project uh, section of the museum in Seattle about Nirvana, uh, and it got me really kind of interested in in, in their development again. And I, I, I think I definitely want to check this out. But as soon as you said hot or cold, I got that Huey Lewis song stuck in my head. <laughs> 
you know what? Weirdly, that's the song they played. That's what I was referring to. The entire song. They're always playing Huey Lewis. And I'm like, I came here for the Nirvana. Why are you playing Hip to Be Square? Because she's Period. hot and cold. Uh, I watched The Americans, uh, the new FX show with Carrie Russell. I actually remembered her name instead of calling her Felicity for once. Uh, it's really good. I was impressed. I, In fact, I was a little skeptical. I wasn't sure I was going to like it. And it blew me away. Right on. Take, and uh, takes place in the 1980s, sleeper agents from the KGB, and it's very 1980s to the point that they don't hit you over the head. And then what's killer about it is you go into one of their houses, not every single thing is from the 80s, right? Whenever you do like a, a 1980s movie or TV show now, like everything is from the 80s in the house. Some of the stuff in there is from the 70s. Some of it's just generic, could be from like any era in the 20th century. Uh, and so it's just so nice and so subtle. And they pick 80s music, but it's not cheesy 80s music. Uh, in fact, they use Tusk by Fleetwood Mac for a chase scene perfectly. Just that's awesome. Perfect music editing. In fact, they should win a, a, an, a an Emmy for sound editing alone. Uh, also, what, uh, uh, yes. What, what station is that on? Like, how how can I see it? F FX. Okay. Station. I just station. I, I, as soon as I said, as soon as I said, on my VHF TV, which one? As soon just as I keep, said that. Just ask just, your daughter you know to get up and keep turning till you know Dude, till you find I, it. I, you're the one who broke character. You said it was all 1980s, so I was trying to just keep rolling with it. I'm going to pretend oh, like it's about. Oh, okay, okay. Let's just all say right. that. All right. Um, Arrow uh, starting to slow down for me a little bit. Yeah. I, I think it may be like this is a 13 episode season that they're trying to stretch into 26. I'm not sure, uh, but uh, I'm still still going to keep watching it. Love and Top Chef, and uh, I've I've been binging on old Futurama. I just can't recommend uh -huh. it enough. Even I've seen them, some of them I've seen many, many times. But I'll tell you I what, man, I would, I would so be diving into Futurama if it, it's in that uncanny valley where I can almost watch it in front of my children, but it's still mm, not there. Yeah. Every yeah. so often there's like those cringe moments and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Oh, believe me, I've, we've got family over uh, and I, I, I've been wanting to watch the latest episode of Archer. Oh, That's sure. just not when you flip out and... <laughs> <laughs> in front of the whole that's family. That's why ants, man. Come on. I noticed <laughs> this that is Archie why we get ants. That's why, yeah. <laughs> Let's see some feedback, shall we? Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Matthew, a.k.a. Katana, says, I need a quick recommendation if you have a moment. I'm a cord cutter that uses mostly online viewing but also has an HD antenna and an ITV to watch live TV and a few shows that aren't on Hulu. The problem is that two weeks from now, I'll be getting my new MacBook Pro with a retina display, which will become my primary computer. The problem this creates is that if I have my laptop with me in the evening then there will not be a machine at home to record my shows. So here's his two options. Buy a standalone DVR that will record the shows even if there is no computer present. Uh, find a website that can easily point to harder to find but official streams of the shows, i.e. CBS Stream Survivor on their website. It takes about five clicks from the homepage. Uh, so he wants to know, is there is there one of those two things? I'd say buy the DVR. Uh, yeah, and no, whether it's a simple TV, video. which is actually you need a Roku to take advantage of. So it sounds like that might not be the best option. Or if it's just keep your old computer around and, and make, well, and make that make that old that computer was the first just thing be that your TV. my mind. It, it was the first thing that popped into my mind as well. It's like uh, if you've got an old computer, definitely repurpose it. But I'm assume let's assume that, you know, it has to go live somewhere else and there's a reason for it. But j just do the DVR. You'll be very happy, I think. But, what, a TiVo? So, uh, get a TiVo. So there. Yeah, TiVo, that stuff. Or or Mythbox or, you know, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with that. Yeah, here we go. Uh, one? This one from Joshua. Hey, guys, love the show. Please read this email because it's something I'm dying to know more about. Do nope. Sony uh, sorry, Joshua. On to... Will no, okay. <laughs> do Sony and 20th Century Fox have to renew their contracts with Marvel to retain their rights to the respective franchises, Spider-Man and X-Men? I wonder if Disney would have any chance of buying back the rights. From what I've read, the reason franchises like Daredevil revert back is because the studio doesn't make another film within a certain amount of time since the previous film. I'm sure that's why Fox and Sony try to turn out their films faster than we could blink. If I were Disney, I'd figure out a way to get the rights back. A unified Marvel Cinematic Universe would rock our socks off. Uh, thanks, Joshua. I, I, I don't know that it automatically would rock our socks off. It's like, um, uh, I mean, theoretically, that would be neat, but I don't know that it 
would make any kind of dollars and cents for for Disney to bother to do. And you are right. That's why Sony uh, put out, you know, everyone talks about the reason that they did a reboot of the Spider-Man franchise so fast was because they wanted to retain the rights and start a new franchise. Uh, But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It just sounds like so much fan talk to me. And I would say what you're describing might be cool might be an epic disaster that you would regret and that would make you sad about Marvel. I don't know. I mean, I think that's that's a fair point to bring up. But the other side is, wouldn't you like to see Spider-Man in the Avengers movie with Joss Whedon directing? Well, yes. Okay. That's why I mean, you that, can't see okay, Spider-Man the in the Avengers okay. movie right now is because those that, rights Tom. are still held by Sony. Wouldn't you like to see an old lady get stabbed in the eye if if Joss Whedon was directing? Like you could you add if Joss Whedon was directing to anything and all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I actually, that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> Name, try, try me. Name one thing. That's a, that's that a logical like fallacy, though. I think it would be good for Disney to get Spider-Man back uh, if for no other reason than Spider-Man could be in the Avengers. The, the two yeah. classes, the two cases here are Sony keeps the rights to Spider-Man and there is no Spider-Man in the Avengers or Sony loses the rights to Spider-Man and Spider-Man is in the Avengers. I will take the second case. Yes, I agree. It would be I neat. will not this want to good, see... Though. Joss Whedon, direct, it'll, you know, I'd probably watch that, actually. Uh, Will in Portland uh, says, so far in frame rate, you've discussed loving a show before it becomes popular with the masses, in this case, Doctor Who, and then wanting said masses to keep their hands off it. Well, it was ours first. Then the discussion went on with the sense of resentment that some geeks have when they love something and can't understand why the population at large doesn't get it. Firefly in this example. So what about being a geek who doesn't find out about an amazing show that is adopted by the geek community and has to come to it either after the show is dead or after the masses have begun to latch on to it? I started watching Doctor Who last year and only finally watched Firefly for the first time last week. And I noticed with both that because my geek friends have loved them and evangelized them so much, I'm a bit standoffish because I didn't find them first. I found myself avoiding both and almost going out of my way to not watch them. Uh, in the early 90s, we called this the Apple effect. In the late 90s, we called it the TiVo effect. Nowadays, we call it the Radiohead effect. It's, it's when somebody is such an evangelist for something that it turns you off, and you're like, you know what, I'm not even going to try. No, no, how about that? So uh, I agree, this is a very real Apple problem. Five. Say it again? I said, but have you watched Babylon 5? Yes, the Babylon 5 effect. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, here, here's, my, here's my feeling about all of these is you should try, and I know that we are human beings, but I try to endeavor to evaluate something on its own merits and my own feelings and try to keep my prejudices at bay. Don't think I'm not going to like this because somebody else likes it or don't think I'm going to like this because somebody else likes it or the opposite. I'm not going to like it because somebody else doesn't like it. Just try to see if it really honestly is something you enjoy and then yes. let the rest of it just fly. Who cares how many people like it, who likes it, how long it's been liked. Just just try to, you know, if you honestly enjoy something, don't resist it. And if you honestly don't like something, don't try to make yourself like it. Yo, but uh, seriously, uh, the phone just rang and it's Jeff Kanata wanting to know, seriously, have you seen The Shield yet? It's it's the best show on television. <laughs> he just he just said, I, I don't understand why you haven't seen it yet. Has he watched The Wire? Uh, dude, I don't know. I, I think he's watched Breaking Bad. I think he got the memo on that one, though. Yeah. I, I I can't believe you uh, you never saw the prisoner though. Wow, oh, what no. <laughs> actually? <laughs> Man, you really Our, can't. It's the smug superiority that just gets in your veins, and you can't <laughs> help but just be like, "Why haven't you seen? What do you mean you don't know? You're not watching Doctor Who? I don't get it." <laughs> All right, well that is it for this episode of Frame Rate, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much uh, for joining in. Uh, I want to thank you all and uh, let you know our email address is fr at twit.tv. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash fr. And of course, we are live on Mondays at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time right here at live.twit.tv. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.
and Tyler Man. I come over the house. We're, We're best, best friends. friends. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't exactly the pacing of how we do it, but I kind of loved how that came out. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Chad, don't change a thing in edit. But for future reference, the idea is that after we've said goodbye, you play that while the music. So you're not watching us awkwardly oh, hang out. Oh, okay. But all that said, that was kind of brilliant. Okay. okay.